Good morning. How many of you slept well last night? <gasps> wow, remarkable. Thank you, Jesus. That's about a quarter of you. <laughs> That's awesome. <clears throat> I would not have been raising my hand. <laughs> but you know what? It's always great when you don't really sleep well the first night. You crash the second. So hang in, t hang in there, girls. Um, I've never been up here before, as I think I mentioned last night. And we came in Thursday, and so we were with Dennis and Tricia Kent. And Dennis, I, I love forests, I love the woods, and Dennis was telling me that um, this is a relatively new forest because it was all chopped down uh, back in the 1800s. And that intrigued me, and I have to tell you, I want to read more about that when I go home, having been here. Um, I love to learn about places before I go, but there's something about once you've been there and it, you can picture it, you even want to learn more, right? Well, when you go to a, a place you've never been to, what do you do? You ask the locals, hey, where's a good place to eat? Or you'll go Yelp. You know, you don't just typically wing it like, oh, this is close, let's go here. You want to have someone's opinion who knows the area. Um, Jeff, my husband, I think I mentioned, he's been here twice. He came mountain biking up here a couple times with friends. And, you know, having the first time he and his friends had ever been here, they had a map. They had a road biking map. Wisdom would dictate that if you've never been to a place, either ask the locals, find out in advance, or get a map, right, from someone that's charted the area before you. Well, wisdom would indi indicate that we would ask God about our day. You know, we start out our day and we, you know, put our clothes on and we hit the floor running and we've got our coffee down and everything. But wisdom would say, hey, stop. God's already been here. He ordained it. He made this day for you. He has works for you to do that you would just walk in them. And to get the most out of any experience in life, visiting or traveling through a day, ask the one who knows, who knows the place. This morning, we are going to focus on the knowledge of God. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. Well, I'm terrible at being sick. And I wasn't going to share this with you girls, but I've actually been pretty sick this week. I'm feeling a little bit better every day. But uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, when I was at home, and I had the comfort of my husband being there, I would say, I'm so sick. I'm so sick. You know, this can't be happening. And he'd say, I know, I know. He didn't really know. <laughs> Only I really know how just sick. I'm just a baby. Well, when I'm, when I'm with friends and I don't want to burden them, I don't say to Cindy all week, like, I'm so sick. Actually, I'm not. I'd really be whining and exaggerating. But I want someone who has compassion to know how to help me. Well, God knows. He knows. God, I'm so sick. I know. I know. My, my touch is on you. My grace is sufficient. In your weakness, my strength is perfect. God, I'm so heartbroken. I know. I know. I'm saving up those tears. It breaks my heart, too. God, I'm so concerned. We don't have a job. I know. I know. I, am, I am own all the cattle on a thousand hills. I am the provider. Come to me. I know. We can, we can pull off all um, thoughts of needing to cover up or act a certain way or not expose ourselves completely with God. He is the all-knowing one. Psalm 147, 4 and 5 says, He counts the stars and calls them all by name. How great is our Lord. His power is absolute. His understanding is beyond comprehension. 
Imagine the gazillions of stars. He knows them all by name. And you guys have a vantage point of seeing stars that we don't have in Riverside. You, this should really blow your mind away because you're seeing evidence. We just have to believe that by faith. You know, <laughs> really, there's stars up there? <laughs> um, but he knows the stars. And if you ever do a Google search on just how vast the universe is that scientists are even discovering, how many zero zeros behind numbers are stars. He knows them all by name. Well, you know what? That is, that is his creation, but we are made in the image of God. He knows us by name. He kn it's too much to understand, to take into grasp, but just sit on that for a little bit. Let Go outside at some point today by yourself and have no expectation other than just ponder how much God loves you. There's a little beach down there. Take up, I was going to say scoop up sand. No, just lick your finger and, well, you don't even have to lick your finger. Just get your finger in sand and try to count how many sands are on your finger. His love and thoughts for you are more than the sands on the sea, are more than the sands in the desert. You know, and we can't even see all the sand. It, it just blows your mind. He knows. He is omniscient. Remind yourself of that. He is all-powerful, all-knowing. It's, it's a matter of applying this confidence in God knowing one day, one moment at a time. Just reminding yourselves. We are a forgetful people. One set... Uh, situation, one conversation, one need at a time, and sometimes, as I mentioned last night, one moment at a time. At a couple's retreat many years ago, in fact, it was right on the threshold of us homeschooling, so we were brand new believers. We homeschooled for the entirety of our kids' education. Um, but I was, I was really excited about it. And so we, Jeff and I went to a bookstore in our free time, like a Barnes & Noble. And I said, you know, I want to get a book on history. And he's like, okay, that's because I didn't know about curriculum and all that stuff. I just thought, well, i got to come up with my own book on history. So he's browsing his books. And this is a true story. I come to him with this leatherback, big binding book. <laughs> and it says on the top of it, the history of the world. <laughs> and I said, here, I'll start here. And just like, you know, how about if you just slice one little chunk of history at a time? I just, I wanted my kids to know it all. If I'm going to homeschool them, I'm going to put on my super mom homeschool cape and I am going to teach them the history of the world. You know, whoa, <laughs> did, I, did I get a wake up call? He says, just start with one point in history at a time. And that's, God is, he invented knowledge. He knows it all. But as it soaks in, start with just one moment at a time. God, it's good. It's sufficient. It's comforting to me. It's reassuring to me that you are in this moment. You've gone before this moment in time or this situation. He is omnipotent, all-powerful, as we mentioned last night. Slice off just one application, one day at a time, with the power of God, now with the knowledge of God. Slice off just one application at a time. He is all-knowing. Um, and the more you, you know about God, he reveals himself and his plan and his heart and, and our sinful nature in every page of Scripture the more we can have confidence and faith and rest in that, the more we can trust. Imagine God not only knows the number of stars in the universe, he knows them by name. I already said this. Um, studies show the star's universe uh, is more than the grains of the sands of the earth. All the beaches, all the desert, the, the universe is more expansive 
than even the, the stars in the universe, than all the grains of the sand. What an incredible picture of the omniscience of God. God knows me, he knows my name, and I'm made in his image. And I don't remember if I prayed or not, but this is a great time to pray, right? Lord, thank you for your love for us that knows no limit. It is as vast as the heavens, as the universe, as deep as the sea, and I understand this lake is one of the deepest in the world. Lord, it's deeper than the oceans, Lord, but yet it is so intimate that you know every breath I take. You know the thoughts that I have before I even think them. You have an answer coming to every prayer I will ever pray in the name of Jesus before I even utter it, before I even know it's a need. That's just too much for me to understand, but I'm thankful, God. I'm thankful that love is so great. And as we consider your omniscience, Lord, um, help us to apply it and be changed by it and comforted by it and declare that to a lost and dying world. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Psalm 139, 1-4. O oh Lord, you have examined my heart. You know everything about me. You know when I sit down or I stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it. God knows all about our future. Jeremiah 29, 11 and 12. This should bring such great comfort. This is my husband's life verse. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans of good and not for evil or harm, to give you a future and a hope. And in those days when you pray, I will listen. He listens to us. His plan will unfold, and he listens as we pray. If we believe he knows and we know he cares for us, he cares about us, he cares about things that concern us, it should increase our faith and our ability to trust him. Faith and trust to make it through the, the seasons and the storms that we talked about last night. And that he has the power and the knowledge the power to calm things down, settle things down, and then the knowledge where we need to land in this. What, what will await us when we land in this, when we get to the other side. Not if we get to the other side, but as his child when we get to the other side. So based on the fact that God is omnipotent and omniscient, how is my faith lived out? If his ways and his understanding so far beyond me, how can I grasp, how can I, how can I even handle that one slice at a time, one verse at a time, one need at a time, one miracle at a time, one kiss? I, I often say, oh, this is such a kiss from the Lord. You know, just the awareness that God didn't need to do that. He didn't need to remind me that. He didn't need to play that song or share that verse at that time. Last night, um, opening in worship, I whispered to Cindy, 10,000 reasons for my heart to sing. That's my favorite worship song. God didn't need to do that. That was a kiss from the Lord for me. And you know, I receive those things. He's all knowing. He, he knows it ministers to you, the worship, but he knows that it ministers to me in a very unique way. One day at a time of leaning, pressing hard onto him, one situation at a time. So let's say Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 again together. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. And today, this morning, lean not on your own understanding. It's obvious. We, we have faulty understanding. 
Am I right? Do sometimes our emotions guide us in our understanding or perceiving a situation incorrectly? Sometimes does that happen? Don't leave me up here by myself. <laughs> Just sometimes. <laughs> yeah. This morning, so, if we know our thoughts are wicked, if we know there's roots of stuff there that shouldn't be there, bitterness, envy, jealousy, whatever, we need to press hard into the Lord. This morning, I want to focus on having a teachable heart. Do you have a teachable heart? Trisha, I'm so thankful, is going to have just a little workshop then, because ours is the heart behind why we want to study the Word of God. And Trisha's going to equip us for a little bit of the how-to, because we need both. Without the heart behind it, it's just an exercise of intellect. Without the, well, the opposite of that is all wrong too. So, <laughs> listening with intention and a heart to obey. I find it, I found it kind of cute because evidently there's this little cell service spot right there. Am I right for some of your phone carriers? No, you were just all talking to your husbands together in a little powwow? Oh, that's delightful. Maybe it was just a slice of sun in the, I, I guess I falsely cons, uh, concluded that that must be where like Verizon gets their cell service. I have AT&T, so I get it fine in my room. <laughs> I don't know why. I am not, I have no interest in AT&T or Verizon or anything. I don't know why I said that. But um, getting to a place where the Lord is saying, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? You know, a place away from distractions, a place where the signal, his signal is always strong enough. It's us positioning ourselves in a place where we can hear God, listening to him with an intent to obey. So both important. It should be the goal of every Christian. Sometimes lessons are easier to, some lessons are easier to receive than others. You know, you can't wait to have this comfort and reassurance that, oh, oh, the blessings and yes, Lord, yes, I receive, I hear, I'm excited, I can't wait. Some lessons, some, some instruction is easier to receive than other. Well, we're going to look this morning on principles that encourage us to have the right response. The benefit is going to be for us first, our lives, in having the abundant life. But then, just as important, is bringing God glory with our lives. You know, we are not in a bubble. It is not all about us. We want to live a life in obedience and honor to the Lord to bring him glory. The purpose we were created to enjoy God uh, and bring him glory forever to know God. Um, things in life we learn, some are because of necessity. School subjects, it is still a law in America, thankfully, that a child needs to go to school. We have options on how that is fulfilled, but it's the law that children go to school. So those lessons, math, uh, reading, spelling, those are not a choice. Um, other lessons are by consequence. You put your finger on a hot stove, that is a lesson, you know, that, oh, that hurts. And children learn that by consequence. We, as we get older, we learn lessons by consequence. If you speed, you are going to get a ticket. It doesn't pay off. Um, and still other lessons are because of a personal desire to learn. As a child, a child doesn't have to ride a bike. It's not a law, or swim, or play a sport. It is a, it's a lesson they will learn, a skill by choice. Elective subjects in school as you get older, foreign subjects, home, home ec. Um, as adults, a career path, you're honing in now on what your lessons you will learn because of a personal desire, a craft, a hobby. Regardless of your motive, whether you're, you have to, it's a consequence, or a personal desire, lessons are a reality of life. 
We, we are going to learn lessons every day of life if we are a good student, if we have a desire to learn. There'll be continual learning. The focus this morning is on having a personal desire to learn of Jesus, to learn of his word. Specifically, why is it even important? And I would go so far as to say essential to sit at the feet of Jesus and read his word and pray and listen to the Holy Spirit speaking to us. Why are you reminded by a well-meaning, mature sister or husband or person, pastor, did you read the word of God this week? Did you read, did you do your devotion this morning? Why is that important? Sometimes the purpose and the heart behind it is overlooked and, and it's just like, oh yeah, I did that, check that off. I think we all know that's, that's not the heart behind the heart of God in real growth. One of my favorite quotes is by Warren Wearsby. We don't read the Bible to circle the precious promises, although there are many. Nor do we read it to learn Bible doctrine, although it is essential. We read the Bible to get to know the heart and mind of God. So we read the Bible to understand the character, the heart and mind of God, his plan. Doctrine is essential. Sound doctrine is essential. The promises, they are there for our reassurance and comfort. They are so vital to encouraging us in trusting God. But we read the word of God to know our good, good Father, to know his love in sending Jesus, to know the power we have in the Holy Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit, the consequence to a life of rebellion in sin. That's why we read the word of God. Through reading and studying and obeying, responding to obeying the word of God, we become more like Jesus. That's sanctification, not salvation. Salvation is a moment in time. You go from darkness to light, from death to life, from hopelessness and despair to hope and purpose. That is salvation. But sanctification, we are all in the process of it. From the moment of conversion until the moment of our final breath, we are being made more and more in the image of Jesus. We are all learning. Luke 640 said, students are not greater than their teacher, but the student is who is fully trained will become like the teacher. So we'll never be greater. We'll never be uh, greater than him. But we, as we study and obey and fully trained, as the scripture says, we will become more like Jesus. We will find matters of trust much more easy to accept and bring glory to God through. So focus this morning on having a teachable heart. So much in our attitude and our desire uh, is involved. The amount of effort involved, our response to what we learn is tied to our ability to trust God. Think of watching TV. Some shows I would we don't even have cable anymore. We have like little banana, banana ears. <laughs> we have little rabbit ear antennas. Um, so we don't even have cable anymore. Some TV shows are just mindless entertainment. There's no, there's no, um, emphasis, thankfully so, on desiring to apply and remember and be like what we see on TV, secular TV. Do I hear an amen on that? Amen. Um, it's a waste of time in many cases. What I do miss about having cable, though, is the History Channel and the Learning Channel and things like that. Those were our favorite shows. I love to learn, but you know what? There's a lot of um, YouTube things that you can selectively watch what you put in. Uh, I love to learn. 
But even those shows on the History Channel and things like that, Discovery Channel, I loved like the Alaskan wilderness shows, you know. I'm not watching that with a desire to learn and go out and do that. My husband might be. <laughs> we both would love to live off the land if, if there was a church that God wanted us to be a part of in no man's land. But anyway, I'm off. I'm, I'm on a little rabbit trail with that. <laughs> Um, so these shows I don't watch with the intent of changing my life or applying much of what I watch uh, to change who I am or what I do. But what about instructional videos? In my many years of homeschooling, especially as the kids got older, there's great tools of instructional videos on math lessons. And we did with the intent. We would pause, we would rewind, we would, you know, look and, okay, you'd, you'd look more closely because a grade was dependent on our kids getting this subject. So it stepped up a lot in our um, note taking, in our attention, all in an effort to master the material. Grades mattered. It takes a teachable heart, though. Truth is, even in important classes, some may not care or have a desire to learn, and a grade will affect that effort. Um, but we're not being graded like on a scale, like in school. We are being blessed with with a peace, with the fruit of the Spirit, with the knowledge, with the abundant life, when we have intention to obey, when we learn the lessons from the Word of God. Proverbs 12, 1 says, Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. <laughs> That's the Word of God. So we don't want to be stupid, do we? No. We want to have a teachable heart. We want to lean on God's understanding. Lean not on our own understanding. We are stupid when we do that. We affect the lives of others when we lean on our own understanding, when we follow our flesh and the world and our sinful desires. A good grade is not the goal, but the abundant life that God has for us as we make the effort to apply in obedience what the teacher instructs. A peace that passes understanding. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and thanksgiving. Make your request to known to God. And then that peace, as you trust him, as you talk with him, as you obey him, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So open your Bibles, ladies, to Psalm 119. I'm taking you to the history of the world, the longest book in the Bible, Psalm 119, the longest uh, chapter in the Bible, rather. <clears throat> but we're only going to look at a few verses, verses 33 to 40. And when I thought about, okay, I really want them to know the importance of, word of the Word of God, there's... Every page in scripture would point to that in some fashion or another. But this psalmist, all but just a couple verses, this psalmist goes back to the word of God, the precepts, uh, his statutes, the law. This psalmist knew the importance of everything going back to the word of God as life. So, teach me, O Lord, is the title of my, my message. Teach me, O Lord, but kind of a subtitle would be not leaning on our own understanding, leaning on his understanding. <clears throat> we understand with this title, teach me, O Lord, that I am the student and the Lord is the teacher. Psalm 119, 33 and 34. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. I've got just three little points this morning. One, student learning. 
Teach me, O oh Lord. We're a student learning. And that's a statement. But I want you to pose it as a question personally. Am I a student learning? God wants us to be. That is the goal of an abundant Christian life. I am a student learning. I don't know it all. You know, I mentioned real quickly last night, I am a substitute teacher at Harvest Christian School. And um, we have from the little babies pre-K to sixth grade. And I, the kids know me well enough to know by now I've been doing that um, for seven years since our youngest graduated high school. But they know my favorite part about subbing, my favorite part about teaching, is when they have a subject that they don't get. Usually it's math. And I'll teach the lesson to the whole class. And then I'll say, now, do you guys have it? OK, if more than a third of the class don't have it, I'll reteach it, maybe using other little memorable tricks or something. OK, now, how do you feel about this? Do a couple sample things. And then they know that if they don't get it today, tomorrow's lesson is going to be harder. So they've all made a promise with me. They promise that they will raise their hand. Mrs. Dietz, I don't get it. Come and come by my side and teach me this one-on-one. Um, -on -one. And when they, you can see in a child's face when they don't get it. And they'll, they'll struggle and they'll have the furrowed brow. And I will stay with them until they get it. And then they'll look up at me. <gasps> I get it. And I'll do the jump. I said, that's my favorite part of teaching. And the whole class knows, that's your favorite part of teaching. <laughs> you know, so there's no shame. I never, especially with a sub, they're like, oh, I don't want to ask her for help. God says, I am here. I've sent it in my word for all who would read and believe. But my Holy Spirit will be in your life, and he's there with you. And you stay on this one problem. You stay on this one issue of life. And you keep looking to me and saying, I don't get it, God. Or I, I can't get it. I don't want or it hurts too bad. And he's like, OK, we're going to keep at it. I'm going to keep reminding you. I'm going to keep loving you. And then when you look up at him and you say, I get it, God, I get it. Don't you just picture the Lord saying, she gets it, she gets it. <laughs> Jesus saying to the Father, she gets it, she gets it. <laughs> he loves us. He, he, there is no shame in coming to our creator and saying, not only do I don't get it, I don't want to get it, Lord. I don't want to do it. He is the teacher. Teach me, O oh Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I'll keep your, your law. Give me understanding. The implication is we don't have it. This point is critical to understand. It's true in ourselves and, our, and true in others. We are all students. If we look to some other person to have all the answers or to um, live the perfect life that we know Christ did, we miss it. We are all students. That should, that should speak grace and compassion and agape towards each other. It also should speak encouragement. I long to encourage you in your faith, but I also long to be encouraged by you in my faith. That way we are a mutual blessing to each other. That's Romans 1.12 and the old New Living translation. They redid it and messed it up. But <laughs> <laughs> learning is an ongoing process. The implication is that we build on what we don't know, add more to our knowledge, Sanctification, as I said, being more like Jesus. It should be growth in applied obedience to what you've already learned. You know, what they're learning in fourth grade is not what they learned in pre-kindergarten. We have refresher times. There's always review things, review spelling words. They learned them at the beginning of the year, but they still need the refreshing. So we, we refresh, but we build on what we already know. Biblically, ladies, you cannot separate learning from obedience. 
you have to have applied obedience in order to learn. If you keep touching that stove, you are not learning that it hurts and it burns. Applied obe learning is the application of obedience. You can't separate one from another. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes. The, cry, the psalmist cries out to the Lord to be taught. Not just crying out for a quick fix to the problem. We're prone to do that, aren't we? Lord, I know I trust you. You know, I know you can do something about this. But this psalmist sets the example. Teach me. You know, in my years of having a prodigal, my husband and I would both say loud and clear, we learned probably more lessons about ourselves in those years than, than anyone. Not just crying out for the quick fix. Teach me. Is he the Lord of our lives? Teach me, O oh Lord. That's, we talked about that last night. It, everything will fall on deaf ears. You won't want to. You won't have the motivation if he's not the Lord of your life. He is friend, but is he Lord and master of all? Matthew 7, 22 and 23. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Oh, that's scary. For, for someone to be so deceived. Lord, didn't we do all these things for you? Didn't we live a life that seemed to everyone else that we loved you? And he'd say, you didn't love me. I was not Lord of your life. The game's up. That's scary. What Jesus is saying, I know by your heart, by your conduct, if I am truly Lord, whether you are a true follower of Jesus Christ or not. And there will be a day when that truth is revealed. Is Jesus Savior and Lord of our lives? The ultimate punishment would be, depart from me, for I knew you not. Salvation is not dependent on anything other than our faith in Christ, his shed blood, his resurrection from the dead, his righteousness imparted to me. Salvation is a free gift. It's not earned, unmerited grace, favor, not worked for. But proof of our salvation is a life of obedience. The, and greater obedience the more we walk with Christ. Some cry out, Lord, Lord. They have a desire for his help but they won't necessarily respond in obedience of that way being obtained. I, I had a friend years ago, and she used to homeschool, and her daughter, when she entered high school, wanted to go to public high school, which I am not, I believe homeschooling is a calling on your life, and woe to you if you resist that calling. I'm not one that would say everybody must homeschool, so understand that premise here. But, um, because her daughter wanted to go with all her friends and, and go to high school, she, she succumbed to that pressure. And almost immediately, she started doing the very dark gothic look with the black lipstick and black clothing. And you could see the darkness. And my friend, I'll call her Jay, she called and cried, and I could see it. And you know, help, help. I, she was in a crisis. Their family was in a crisis. The rebellion, the lying, the deceit, all these things. And she knew to turn to the Lord for help, to cry out to help. She knew of God's love, his faithfulness, his ability to help. She did not lack faith. But when I asked her directly, Jay, are you willing as the parent to bring your daughter home, to rein this back in, to sever these ties with this influence, her response was, no, I can't. Her daughter would never do that. She didn't lack faith. She lacked obedience. There must be another way around obtaining God's best than the hard call of standing up in this situation. 
God's best requires obedience. You cannot separate the two. So often we can do the same. We cry out to the Lord in faith, but we'll respond maybe in only partial obedience. I don't mean to imply that you have an intentional rebellious heart, but somehow you're leaning on your understanding and God's understanding and hoping these two will somehow, you know, like in a marriage, you know, give and take, give and take. No. God requires complete obedience. You may think, God would never have me do that. Thus, it's the partial obedience. God would never have me stay in this marriage with my husband, you know, whatever. Partial obedience is disobedience. Um, verse 33, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding and I shall keep your law. Remember that show, um, Are You Smarter Than a Fourth or Fifth Grader? Someone that definitely is a lot smarter than me. It's funny how facts and information that you used to memorize and study and, and be tested on and pass with flying colors are easy, easily forgotten. Even simple lessons that you learned in fourth grade, right? You knew that. It's on the tip of your tongue. Well, you know, what was that? What's the biggest planet? Um, even when motivation to recall those things is a lot of money, there's, come on, $1,000 if you can tell me what the biggest planet is. It's like, oh, where is that fact? Well, that shouldn't be with the word of God. The psalmist is crying out, Keep your word in my heart. Keep means to guard, preserve, protect, maintain, obey. Keep studying. Keep remembering. Keep applying. Guard those things, those truths. I post every day um, a scripture on my Facebook wall. I've, Jeff and I have been doing that for about five years. And I go back to that throughout the day. Today was just a very short psalm on praising the Lord. You know, you go back. I keep that. Those are things I meditate on throughout the day. Ask the Lord, and Tricia will help you on how to study the Word of God, what it means. Ask for him to help you to remember. Ask for him to help you apply in obedience. James 1.5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, raise your hand if you lack wisdom, ever. Everybody lacks wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody lacks wisdom in, in really every issue of life, I believe. So what does this promise say? If you ask, I would say, since we lack wisdom, let us ask of God, who gives to all liberally, without reproach, without finding fault, it will be given. And then James goes on to say, and if you doubt, you're like a, in that boat being tossed around. Well, I think you can do it, and you know, no. If we, and I love that little um, addition that without giving reproach. God never will say, you got yourself in this mess. You get yourself out. He will never say that. There will be consequence for the messes and sin and rebellion. That is, he wouldn't love us. It, his law wouldn't be holy and right and true if there weren't consequence to disobeying it. But you know what? The consequence to going on in that is far, far more grievous than to just stop. God, I lack wisdom here. I lack the heart here. I lack the will to obey here. Teach me. I am the student. You are the teacher. Guard your word in my heart. Keep me on the right path. When we realize that the way that by obedience to God's commands, we find true peace and happiness and richness, we will hunger for even a greater commitment to obedience. I was talking recently to a young man, and he was dating um, a young lady, and we know this family well, and I, I didn't know the young lady he was dating, so I felt I had the liberty. I said, is she a believer? And he's in high school, and he says, yeah, she is. And he says, but you know, I don't think it's a sin to date someone who's not a believer. 
ding, 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 you're wrong there, but I didn't, I didn't slam him with that. It was interesting because he goes on to say, he says, it's just a lot easier when they are. And I said, you know, you have a perfect defense for why it is right and good to obey God. It is a lot easier. It is a lot better. You save yourself a lot of harm and heartbreak when we obey the word of God. There's a pastor, James McDonald. I think it was him that says, you know, whenever you see God's word says, do not do this and so, thus and so, it's, it's him saying, do not get hurt by doing this. You know, it's, it's the protection God has over us, all the do nots. So it is a lot easier. It is a lot better. Well, as I even say that, though, God's ways are hard. It's not easy to obey, but it's better. We'll leave it at that. Um, <clears throat> when we realize that our wholehearted obedience to God's laws, God's way, is for our good and for his glory, you're going to be more likely to want to look for ways to obey him. So it's key to remember we are a student learning. Do we all agree with that? We're all students learning. The Lord is the teacher. I'm the student. It's an ongoing, lifelong process, understanding and then obedience, and it's a wholehearted commitment. The second principle is from verse 35 to 37. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in them. Incline my ear to your testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. You know, I just realized as I was reading this, you kind of have a little bit of insight on how I do my private devotions. I'm a very visual person. You may or may not be able to tell that. <laughs> I'm kind of animated. I, I, you know, make, I, I just picture things. When God is giving me instruction, turn away my eyes. I just, I visualize that, and, and I'll do that at times. It's just the reality of what he's really speaking. These are life-giving directives for my life. I want to see that in my mind's eyes. I want to play it out before the Lord as I receive it so I can act on it in life. The second principle in Teach Me, O Lord, is student living. Student living. Again, student learning, pose that as a question. Am I a student learning? Do I want to be a student learning? Student living, am I a student living in obedience to the word? Do I want to be a student living in obedience to the word of God? How we live testifies as to whether or not we look to the teacher for our lessons in life and whether we respond in obedience to that instruction. Student living is a walk with the Lord. It's just your daily walk. Walk implies movement. When I was a brand new believer, this struck me and I still picture it to this day. Pastor Greg said, a walk with the Lord implies movement. You are either walking towards glory, being sanctified, or you're walking towards the, war the world. Lukewarm is just stagnant. Am I using my gifts? Am I growing? Am I reading? Am I obeying? I'm walking towards glory. I'm walking towards a life that honors Jesus. Am I looking a lot more like the, the world in what I watch, in how I talk, in what I do with anything, my time, resources, gifts, then you're walking that way. Stagnancy, lukewarm. Jesus says, I'd rather you be either hot or cold, because if you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew, spew you out of my mouth. A walk with Jesus implies movement. We want to be a student living and walking towards Jesus. I did a um, three-day uh, purity seminar for our, our local junior high school, not our on-campus school, but Woodcrest Christian School, a couple of years ago. And every, it was just for the girls, uh, three days of purity. And every day, I wore a black and white dress. I wore something black and white. And I had on one end of it light, Jesus, and one, darkness and death. 
And I wanted them by the end of those three days to impress on their little teachable minds that every action, every decision, every thought truly is black and white. Am I walking in a way, thinking in a way, talking in a way, serving, loving, being a friend in a way that honors Jesus and the light? Or am I looking like the world and gossiping or telling, being mean or posting things? You know, that's a big thing is with kids. Girls can be so mean. Um, walking towards the dark. So I want us to know walking Student living, how are we living? Every choice, every, the Proverbs woman, the law of kindness is on her lips. How do you respond to your husband? Is it the kindness? Is that how you're living? Is that how you're treating? Irregardless of how he's been to you, your children, grace-filled, the law of kindness on your lips? Or are you lashing out and acting out in the flesh? And we can go there. We all can. We're all students learning. Repent. I am sorry. I am sorry. I should have said this to you, even if it's three days later. You know what? The Lord loves me too much to let me get away with treating you like that. And he loves you too much with having it be okay. Student living walk with the Lord is going to be different than the world. Not tied to worthless things. The psalmist says in verse 35, make me walk in the path of your commandments for I delight in them. And it's not this, you know, I got to do this. I delight. I find joy in walking in his commandments. And you really will when you know the heart and mind of God. When you experience the joy in obedience, you will love. You, it'll be make me walk, but you will love to do that. The implication is on my own, I'm going to go that way. As I was working on this part of the study, I was thinking of that song, that old hymn, Prone to Wander, Lord, I Feel It, Prone to Leave the One I Love. Do you know what? Do you know the backstory behind that? Some of you worship leaders might. Um, the title of it is Come Thy Fount of Every Blessing. And uh, Robert Robinson, who, is, who penned that, that great hymn, had always been prone to wander. As a teen, he got in real serious trouble, and then he gave his life to Jesus, and he was converted, and he went into ministry, and he wrote this hymn at the age of 23, and this was in the 1800s, I believe. So he wrote this hymn. The Lord got a hold of him, prone to wander. He, he reads this. He understands it. He writes this hymn. This hymn is still sung today, but later in life, Robinson did stray again from his faith. And he was once in a stagecoach. He sat by a lady who was reading a hymn book with this old hymn. And she showed him, Come thou fount, saying how wonderful it was. He tried to change the subject, but he couldn't. Finally, he said, Madam, I am the unhappy man who wrote that hymn many years ago. And I would give a thousand worlds to enjoy the feeling I had back then. Prone to wander. God got a hold of him, used him, blessed him. He wandered again, and he's thinking, I would give a thousand worlds. But you know what? It doesn't say in the account of his life, but Jesus gave his life that he would come back and give second and third and hundred chances to live with that blessed assurance again. The fount of every blessing is through Jesus and the obedience to his word. We do well to acknowledge our tendency to wander in our flesh and sinful ways. Every single one of us is prone to do the same. Paul reminds us, uh, Paul reminds the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, 6 to 13, of the examples in scripture that caused some to fall. He said these things are set for our examples. Learn from them. Don't do as they did. Don't fall to lustful thoughts. Don't be idolaters. Don't be sexually immoral. Don't give in to temptation. Don't complain. You know, isn't that interesting when you have these sexually immoral and lustful thoughts and all that, and then he's like, and don't complain. 
We're prone to wander and complaining, right? You know, guard my heart. Let me keep. I want to learn. I want to obey. I want to be a student living. He says, these things are written for our examples, for our admonition. Verse 12 in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, therefore, let him think... Let him who thinks he stands take heed, like pay attention to this, lest you fall. Don't be prideful. Realize, God, I need your help. So contradictory to our flesh and the worldly way of thinking, saying, you can't make me do that. Boy, do we have a generation of kids that are thinking, you can't make me do that. And I'm in a protest if, oh, don't get me started. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. But you know, um, a humble, dependent, Christ-honoring life is make me follow your commands because I know I'm prone to wander. The flesh and the spirit are always at war with each other. Jesus came and saved our spirit. He saved our lives, but we live in a fallen flesh and in a sinful world. And that war is more intense than ever before. A life given over to the flesh will end in death. A life yielded to the spirit is going to lead to an abundant life here and for all of eternity. The way the Lord answers this prayer is by filling us with our helper, our counselor, the Holy Spirit. And we're going to focus on his role in our lives, lives tonight, that He is always with us. We cannot walk in a manner pleasing to the Lord apart from abiding in Jesus, apart from help and enabling of the Holy Spirit. John 15, 5, I'm the van, vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Without me, you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. Without him, we really, of any significance, can do nothing. We'll bear much fruit on the other hand if we abide in him. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's an abiding presence of Jesus in our lives. That's the student living, bearing fruit, a life surrendered to the Spirit of God, yielded to and obedient to him. It's a benefit for us, and it brings him glory. Verse 35b, for I delight in it. It's the best. It's the best way to live, student learning, student living. And finally, um, oh, maybe not finally, almost finally. <laughs> Verse 36 and 37, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn my eyes away from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. God's word will direct our whole being. Our heart directed to his testimonies as we re read this, and then not to covetousness, not to pining after the things that we want. It's destructive, the covetousness. The tactics of the enemy to lure us away from a thankful, grateful, content heart know no limits. The enemy will, will try to deceive um, and tantalize us with what we don't have. Um, you know, if you've ever been to someone's house and they've recently done a kitchen remodel and, and whatever, you've, your dishwasher's broken, whatever, there's no limit, limit to how the enemy wants to come in and, well, if you just had a dishwasher, you know, then you'd be content. So your husband, you save, you get a new dishwasher, and it's that stainless steel, but your refrigerator's white. And you're hoping, the icebreaker's already broken, and you're hoping the icebreaker will be the precursor to the fridge so you can get a matching stainless steel fridge. And then your sink is that old, white, scratchy stuff. 
you know, and then you want the granite counters. And if you only had the granite counters, you would be content. But your granite counters, you've got this yellow tile on the floor. And your walls, wallpaper, who has wallpaper? It knows no limit. Direct my eyes, Lord, to following you, not to pining after what I don't have, because it will never stop. And you know what? All those things, if you have the money and the budget, you can buy them. Okay, that's fine. But what about her husband's a, a, um, a very godly man? He teaches a Bible study. My husband is on a bowling league on Friday night. You know, if I only had a godly husband, the tactics of the enemy to rob, steal, kill, destroy, no, no limit, direct Turn my eyes away from temporary, worthless things, God, and direct me to following you. Incline my heart. I want to fully obey you. Revive me in your way. God's word turns our heart away from those things that are temporary and worthless to a heart of thankfulness. <clears throat> and by the way, worthless things are measured according to God's standards. You could have a million dollar mansion and it be a worthless thing. It's not what man deems it. Um, it, it just, it's, it's the heart. It's, God always is looking at the heart of our attachment to anything, things of this world or heavenly things. 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. So teach me, Lord. We're a student learning. We're a student living now. We're a student longing. Are you a student longing? Do you want to be a student longing? Longing for what, ladies? Establish, verse 38, establish your word to your servant who's devoted to fearing you. Turn away my reproach, which I dread, my sin. I dread that. Your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. Student longing. Two strong words from these verses that led me to this principle of having a teachable heart. Devoted and revive. Strong words, don't you think? Each word conveys to me the wholeheartedness and the desperation of the psalmist. Verse 38 Establish your word to your servant who is devoted to fearing you. The heart of the psalmist is clearly wholehearted devotion to the Lord. Devotion, it's a fiery, hot dedication. Full time and energy towards something. What are you devoted to? Ultimately, even if we have a beautiful family, and we are devoted to them, our supreme devotion, our fiery hot attention, premier focus should be to the Lord. And then the family and the ministry and the workplace and the everything will be the beneficiaries of the right vertical attention. Why is it so important for Christians to have a devotional life, devoted, fiery hot, Time set aside before the Lord to pray, to be still, to prioritize, to submit your thoughts, plans, dreams to the Lord, to seek his will and direction. The essential part of this is reading and meditating on the word of God. You don't have one without the other. You read, you meditate, you take in, you think about, and then you desire to apply it, to obey it, to rest in it if it's a promise, to confess if it's, if it's um, a conviction of sin. The psalmist also wants to stand before the Lord with a clean heart. Verse 39, turn away my reproach which I dread, which are, for your judgments are good. Turn away my shame, dishonor. The psalmist hates his sin. In Jesus, our sin is removed. Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation for anyone who is in Christ Jesus, who doesn't walk according to the flesh, but walks according to the Spirit. Another tactic of the enemy, you did this, 
you know, that shame, that on that shameful, sinful act, take it to the most tenth degree you can, no matter how shameful it is, if it is covered by the blood of Jesus. We are washed white as snow. We confess our sins, and the Lord chooses not to remember them anymore. They are coming there, thrown deeper than Lake Tahoe. They are thrown into the depths of the seas. They are as far as the east is from the west, and do you know that east and west never meet? North and south will eventually, north will become south and south will become north. East and west will never be the other. They will never meet. <clears throat> we are forgiven in Christ. There was judgment for our sin. Christ took that penalty of judgment upon himself. That fact should set our hearts with renewed thankfulness and peace and assurance and a desire for obedience because it cost so very much. Grace, grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Free to us, but oh so costly. In Christ, we do stand before God, a holy God with a clean heart. The only way we can stand before a holy God. We're almost done, girls. Verse 40, behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. I picture one who is so weak, so thirsty, dead. Revive. In each of these desperate conditions of the human condition, it's the word of God that brings life. Revive. You know what it is when someone revives someone and they do the paddles or the CPR or whatever it is, the bypass surgery, they revive. This person was dead. This psalmist realized he is dead. And the way to bring life back to his life is by the word of God. The psalmist who penned this Psalm 119 cries out to be revived throughout this entire psalm. Psalm 119 verse 25 says, My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. Psalm 119, 107, I am afflicted very much. Revive me, bring back life, O Lord, according to your word. Psalm 119, 149, Hear my voice, O Lord. Your loving kindness, O Lord, revive me to your according to your justice. Psalm 119, 154, plead my cause and redeem me, buy me back. Revive me according to what? Your word, your word. God's word revives the thirsty, the desperate, the longing. God wor God's word is the lamp to our feet, the light to our path. Are we a student that, that wants to learn, that wants to live, and that longs for that word imparted in our lives? I hope so. And remember, we're all on this journey. We're all learning. You may feel like you just got in the pre-pre-class, and you're like, this is so deep. God knew you'd be here. He says, start. Just start. Start with one promise. Start with one thing from the message or from a worship song that is the truth of God's word, and let him revive you. Let him get you excited about learning his love. The heart and mind of God is revealed through his holy word. Let's pray. Jesus, we stand, we sit, we bow our hearts and our wills before you. Oh God, mighty God, you are all-knowing, and you have revealed your plan and your love and your purpose and your promise and the condition of man and things to come, things that have been, will be, and are to come, Lord. You have revealed it through your word. We have everything that pertains to life and godliness through Christ. And so thank you that we can know the living word of God Flesh became, or the word of God became flesh and dwelled among us. We know this Savior by the word of God. Help us to long to be more intimately aware 
and to obey, to respond, to long for your word in our lives. May it transform us day to day, moment by moment, Lord. So I thank you. I pray for Tricia as she just gives some instruction on how to study the word of God. Let us continue to be students that gladly receive instruction. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Amen.